made this one to look just like you. Wow, that's a striking resemblance. I know. Oh, I'm so excited it's Easter. I love Easter. It's kind of a shame that it's so close to Black Friday, though. You mean Good Friday. Oh, yeah. Good Friday. Huh. I mean, to put the Easter Bunny holiday right after Jesus' holiday kind of steals his thunder, don't you think? Well, it is Jesus' day. It's the day of his resurrection. Wait a second. So you're saying that the Easter Bunny Easter is the exact same as Jesus' Easter? Oh, no, they're not exactly the same. I mean the exact same day? Yes, two totally different things on the exact same day. So what came first, Jesus or the egg? Well, we're celebrating Jesus. Oh, well then we shouldn't be decorating eggs. No, I mean, eggs symbolize life and the resurrection. So it's okay to decorate eggs? Sure. Well, uh, I'm gonna put a cross on this one just to be safe. You know, maybe we shouldn't think of Easter as this isolated event and instead think of it as a part of a continuous story about our salvation. Yeah, that is exactly right. Yeah. Hey, you know what else? The Jesus that died on the cross is the exact same as the baby Jesus that was born on Christmas. Yes, that is true. They are the exact same person. Yeah, except that Jesus brings us gifts from Santa Claus. I hope you got all your eggs decorated exclusively with crosses. I mean, I gotta start us off on the right foot here. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Mountain View Church. My name is Katarina and I want to welcome you here no matter what you painted on your Easter eggs. For real though, the Jesus we celebrated at Christmas lying in a manger, small, helpless, cute, grew up to be a man who walked this earth, lived a life that was scandalously different, died a brutal death, and then split history in two by doing what no one could do or ever has done since then, rising from the dead. This is what we celebrate today. This is what pumps blood through our veins. This is what we cannot stop talking about here around. It makes us so excited. And we are thrilled that you are joining us today. We hope that this Easter joy will turn everything around in your life. If this is your first time at Mountain View, a special welcome to you in particular. Our gatherings are meant for anyone to feel at home in, whether you are here in person or are watching us online. We hope that this connects with you wherever you are at. And we would love for you to connect back with us if you are interested. Please stop by on our website, mountainviewwhitehorse.ca or on our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter, and use our online connection cards to get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Perhaps you have questions or would like to talk to someone, or you would like prayer. That's what we are here for. We're also interested in your feedback, so please do reach out to us. And if you like what you see and experience with us, we would love it if you spread the word. Let someone in your circle know about Mountain View Church. Forward our link to invite someone simply by clicking on share or invite. This is, this is a, such a special day and we hope that you will walk away from it wanting to tell the world around you. So thank you again for being with us today and happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone. Today is such an amazing day. Today we're celebrating the risen Jesus and there is nothing more important than that. Before I get into my lesson overview, don't forget there's an egg hunt today, 1 p.m. at Rotary Park. We still have tons of snow, but it'll be awesome. Guys, it just means the eggs will be easier to find. In-house, we'll be learning about what Jesus did for us and what it now means for us. If you're not able to join us in-house, don't worry, you too can learn about what Jesus has done for you. 
be sure to check it out online. There are different videos to watch along with Easter worksheets that you can do. No matter which age group you're in, today we are learning how Jesus saved us all. Jesus came to earth and lived a perfect life. Jesus lived a life showing us what the light of God truly looks like. He loved people, he cared for people, he helped people everywhere he went. Even though Jesus did nothing wrong, Jesus was nailed to a cross. Now don't be fooled, he could have stopped it all, but he didn't. Jesus chose to die on the cross. Jesus chose to be the one to pay the price for all the wrong things we do. He took all the sin of the entire world when he was nailed on that cross. All the sin before us, all our sin, and all the sin after us. Jesus loves you so much, he wanted to be the one to die for you. But guess what? Jesus died and three days later, he rose from the grave. Jesus is alive. This changes everything. Our entire faith hinges on Jesus' resurrection. And today we celebrate that Jesus died and three days later rose again. In believing this, you can have Jesus live in your heart. You can have a relationship with Jesus. You can have a life guided by Jesus. And you can have eternal life because of Jesus. I think we can all say amen to that. Go ahead and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place and die for us. Thank you for allowing a way for us to have a relationship with you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. I pray that you open our hearts to receive your love and truly believe what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. There was a moment when the lights went out When death had claimed its victory The King of Love had given up his life The darkest day of history There on a cross they made for sinners for every curse is blood atoned One final breath and it was finished But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn what sacrifice was made is the heavens
My name is Megan and I'll be reading Matthew 28, verse 1 to 10. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took a hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me.
If you're watching this, you're likely here for one of two reasons. You're either watching in celebration or you're watching in skepticism. You're either here to revel in the truths that have spiritually set you free, or you're here with questions that could impact the rest of your life. For those who believe, you approach today with jubilation that He is risen. For those who doubt, you approach today with reservations, asking, has He risen? And some of you might be between these two experiences, either returning to the faith or perhaps wanting to believe, waiting for that spiritual awakening. Wherever you're at today, I am so glad that you're here. You belong here with your joys and fears, questions and inquiries. Whether you're here to remember the story or to examine the evidence, you're welcome. You are welcome. So grab a coffee or a tea, turn those device notifications off and get comfortable. Join us for the next 30 minutes as we explore the scriptural account and the historical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who do you say I am? One question from Jesus still ripples through time. Many questions go unanswered, but this one it cannot be ignored. Is he a prophet, some wondered? A teacher or a philosopher, a liar, a lunatic? No matter what they believed, his death would come brutally, the cross. It was built for pain, constructed to kill and destroy. The cross was built to take, but the open mouth of a grave testifies forever of one exception. And it has not yet been silenced. If the cross speaks of defeat, the empty tomb calls out victory. If the cross screams of judgment, the abandoned shroud thunders freedom. Put yourself there. Rest your hand on a rough boulder pushed aside. Stare into the grave where death was robbed. Listen to a still, small voice. Who do you say I am? and the emptiness of that place will answer you. He is Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our lives. He is Jesus. He rules both ends of time and the places beyond. He is our security. He is our significance. He is our satisfaction. He is Jesus, God's answer to our guilt. He is the son not spared so that we could go free and just as death came through one man through one man comes resurrection it is finished today we're going to be looking at the resurrection account found in matthew's gospel chapter 28. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how to look something up in the Bible, don't worry about it. If you have a print Bible like me, you're going to look at the table of contents in the front, find Matthew and go to the page number. And then you want to get to chapter 28, which is those big numbers there. Now, uh, you can also look on a mobile device and either a tablet or a phone, and you can go into your app store, download a Bible app or just search Bible. And then it, once you download the Bible app, search Matthew 28, and it'll get you there. But maybe for you, you would like a print Bible, but you don't have one. Well, we want to make sure that we can get you one. Right now, you can text Bible to the number on the screen or email Bible at mountainviewwhitehorse.ca. Now, we might not be able to get you the Bible by the time you're done viewing this, but we will get one out to you. We will mail one to you as well as maybe some other material that can help you in your faith journey. Okay, with that there, let's jump in. We're going to read Matthew 28. We're going to cover three uh, of the verses that Megan read for us. She did a great job. Big thanks to her. And then we're going to continue on in the chapter. So let's recap a bit the end of what she read. Matthew 28, verses 8 through 10. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. 
All right. So in this moment, Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appeared to a couple of women that are overwhelmed. They actually uh, hug his feet, bow down, worship him. And and he's like, hey, this thing has just started. You need to go and tell the disciples, Uh, let them know. Now, maybe for you, you're a skeptic, uh, you're just kind of searching your faith, and you're already at this point, you're, you're like, I don't believe it, I don't buy it. And, and to be honest, there's a lot like you, and there have been a lot like you, and, and, and I want us to take a moment to, to kind of maybe address some of your concerns, some of your pushbacks, because actually there's two major pushbacks that we find when people first read the account in the Gospels, in the Bible, of Jesus' resurrection. The first pushback is that people believe Jesus was never dead, that he lived through the crucifixion and then, you know, stood up, walked out of the tomb. Okay. This is one pushback. Uh, The second pushback is that Jesus is still dead. This is the idea that uh, someone stole the body of Jesus and they never actually saw Jesus alive. They're making this whole thing up. Okay. So again, two pushbacks, Jesus was never dead or Jesus is still dead and he never rose and he's not alive now. And so let's talk about this. Let's explore the evidence. We're going to start with pushback number one, which is Jesus was never dead. Now, the, the first problem we have with this pushback, or this idea that Jesus was never dead, is the Roman Empire. Throughout history, uh, the Roman Empire uh, was a massive military juggernaut. And, and actually, history tells us that, that during their time, their long time of conquering all sorts of nations, if there's one thing the Romans knew how to do, it was to kill people. And not just kill people, but the Romans were able to do it in a gruesome, excruciating way. It was called crucifixion. Now, there's more to it than this, though. Romans not only know how to uh, torture people and kill them. If we look at actually the, the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus, we see that after Jesus died on the cross, took his last breath, just to make sure he was dead, um, they put a spear in his side. And we read about this in actually John's gospel. In John's gospel, uh, verse 34 of chapter 19, we read, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. So he's died on the cross and then the soldier makes sure he's dead by putting a spear in his side. It's gruesome to think about. And and then it says blood and water came out. Well, why is this important? Well, in modern uh, medical understanding, we have a little bit of um, evidence or a bit of uh, proof that Jesus may have died, and this blood and water thing might be a great pointer to that. Uh, Let me read a a quote for you. There is evidence from Scripture that Jesus experienced hypovolemic shock as a result of being flogged. Uh, That was when he was beaten, whipped. As Jesus carried his own cross to Golgotha, the Bible says he collapsed. Then during his crucifixion, his body continued to experience trauma. He declared he was thirsty as he hung on the cross, indicating his body's desire to replenish fluids. Prior to his death, the sustained rapid heartbeat caused by hypovolemic shock also causes fluid to gather in the sac around the heart and around the lungs. This gathering of fluid in the membrane around the heart is called pericardial effusion, and the fluid gathering around the lungs is called pleural effusion. This explains why after Jesus died and a Roman soldier thrust a spear through Jesus' side, piercing both the lungs and the heart, blood and water came from his side, just as John recorded in his gospel. This is a medical reason showing why his body was done, that the trauma he experienced had had brought him to death. And not only that, this fluid storing up around his lungs and heart that when the spear went through, it emptied. Jesus was dead. But maybe you still don't believe it. Uh, This is why I want to look to someone by the name of Lee Strobel. Now, Lee Strobel, he's a legal editor, writer, investigative journalist, and he was actually an atheist. And he got so fed up hearing about Christianity and hearing about Jesus and the resurrection, he said, that's it. I'm an investigative reporter. I am going to go through history. I'm going to go through all the evidence outside of the Bible and inside the Bible, and I'm going to look to prove that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And here's what he writes about the idea that Jesus never actually died. 
He writes, skeptics insist that Jesus never died on the cross as the Bible claims. One of the first things I discovered to my surprise is that historians consider Jesus Christ's death on the cross to be a non-controversial fact. As the Journal of the American Medical Association concluded, the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. We have multiple independent reports of his death in the documents that make up the New Testament, and we have at least five ancient sources outside the Bible that corroborate that he died on a cross. Even the Jewish Talmud admits that Jesus was executed. One New Testament scholar, atheist, Gerd Ludman of Vanderbilt University, calls Jesus' death on the cross a indisputable fact. So this is the historic evidence, the medical evidence laid out that Jesus definitely died on the cross and to finish him off was pierced in the side. But we have a little bit more evidence because we need to think about for a moment, Romans knew how to kill people, but then the Roman soldiers under Pilate's careful watch gave the body to Joseph of Arimathea. And we read about that in John 1938. And they never Never once did they anticipate that Jesus would take another breath, never mind have the strength to get up, walk over to a giant stone and roll it away on his own and walk out. Just thinking about the trauma he experienced before the cross, on the cross, and then dying on the cross and the spear to his side, there's no way that they thought this would happen. Jesus died on that cross. Now, pushback number two. Uh, some of you may be thinking, well, that's fine. Well, Jesus is still dead. They, they made this whole thing up. Uh, and the accounts that they saw him after he rose from the dead, they're all bogus. They don't matter. And he died and they just live on this lie. And Christianity as a whole has gone for 2000 years on a big cover up. Let's explore that for a moment. Let's explore that. So if this is your theory, uh, you are in good company. Because actually the very first followers of Jesus, do you know what they believed? They believed that someone stole Jesus' body. Yeah, you heard that correctly. That, that before anyone else who was against Jesus found out that his body was gone, his followers thought someone had stole the body. We learn about this in John 20 verse 2. It says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. These are Jesus' followers. They're, they're panicking. Where's the body of Jesus? He's gone. The tomb's empty. Uh, but then let's get back to our passage. Remember, we started in Matthew 28. Hopefully you still have it open there. And, and if we keep reading uh, in verse 11 to 15, we see it's really fascinating, but there's a problem with the missing body on the other side with Jesus' enemies. Check this out. Uh, it, it, Matthew writes, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this very day. Okay, so let's think about this for a moment. Uh, we have Jesus followers panicking. Where's the body? Someone stole the body. We have Jesus enemies that are trying to pay off the soldiers who have said, hey guys, the body's gone. We buried him. He was dead. Stones rolled away gone. And keep in mind, there's angels that appeared to these soldiers and there's crazy stuff. They're freaking out. And, and there's all sorts of stuff happening. And these priests and elders, these religious authorities are like, this can't happen. He told us for so long and, and throughout the gospels when he was alive and, and, and when he was ministering to the people and serving the people, he said that he was going to rise from the dead and he, and he was going to establish a new kingdom, uh, a new authority. And so these religious leaders are freaking out and they're going to pay off the guards. Say, no, just, just tell everyone that the disciples stole him. But you see that? That's funny, right? Because they're saying, tell everyone that the disciples stole the body. But they don't maybe believe that the body was stolen at this point. It's interesting, isn't it? Both sides. So again, if you believe that someone stole the body, both the good guys and the bad guys both believe the body was stolen. 
But then well, here's what happens. It gets crazy because then Jesus shows up alive. First, he appears to the women who, who first came to the tomb, uh, which is very unlikely in this day and age. This is a very patriarchal culture. And, and so if you were going to create a story, you wouldn't appear first to women. You would probably appear first to men in the first century, and you'd try to either appear to powerful, uh, rich, or religious men. So these average women, not such a good idea if you're going to create a story. But then they go off, and then Jesus appears again to his disciples, his followers, even though a couple of them kind of doubted, one of them in particular named Thomas doubted. But again, he, he relieved all that by telling Thomas to put his fingers in his hands and put, it, put his hand in his side to say, hey, look, the wounds are still here. I died. Here's the wounds. Now I'm alive. But it gets better. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, we read about that Jesus actually appeared to over 500 witnesses alive post-crucifixion, post-burial. That's amazing. And then a little later on, his followers were gathered and he ascended to heaven to be with the Father with the promise to return. G.K. Chesterton, writer, philosopher, theologian, writes this, This is the sort of truth that is hard to explain because it is a fact. But it is a fact to which we can call witnesses. There were hundreds of witnesses that saw him alive and recorded it. Now, here's another interesting uh, quote for you. Paula Fredrickson, now she's an American historian and a scholar of religious studies, not a Christian. She's a skeptic. Uh, there was a documentary done, The Search for Jesus. But here's what she said. She, she had to release her opinion, at least based on the historical evidence as a historian. Here's what she said. I know in their own terms, what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attest to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian, that they must have seen something. So this is crazy. This is someone who's not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus. And she's like, look, I'm a historian. This is what I do. And you look at all the evidence. You look at the facts. They all claim to have seen Jesus. She struggles, maybe believing, maybe you struggle like her, believing, oh, I don't know if I can believe this. But what she does believe is that they believe they saw Jesus. Let me say that again. She doesn't know what she believes, but she believes that they believe they saw Jesus. But now there's a third, uh, a third little bit of information, a bit of evidence that I would like to give to you uh, in regards to Jesus rising from the dead, in particular with his followers. Um, because Jesus' followers didn't just give um, an account, a witness that, that Jesus had risen from the dead. They actually paid for this truth with their lives. There's a great new book out, uh, The Problem of Jesus, written by Mark Clark. He's a pastor, apologist, an author, and uh, he wrote previously The Problem of God. And, and he's exploring the evidence of Jesus, and he's exploring the evidence of the resurrection. And one of the evidences that he talks about is that uh, so many disciples, uh, so many people who have followed Jesus, gave their lives to this message, to this gospel, to this resurrection. And, and when told to recant their faith, they couldn't do it. Why? Because they believed in it. And, and it's hard to believe that someone would die in such excruciating ways as they did if they didn't really see Jesus. Mark Clark writes it this way. Based on the best historical evidence we have, here is what happened to the original disciples of Jesus. Andrew was crucified in Patras, Greece. Bartholomew, a.k.a. Nathaniel, was flayed to death with a whip in Armenia. James, the just, was thrown from the temple and then beaten to death in Jerusalem. John died in exile on the island of Patmos. James the Greater was beheaded in Jerusalem. Luke was hanged in Greece. Mark was dragged to death by a horse in Alexandria, Egypt. Matthew was killed by the sword in Ethiopia. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded in Jerusalem. Peter was crucified upside down in Rome. Philip was crucified in Phrygia. Thomas was stabbed to death with a spear in India. And then Mark Clark says this, 
The rise of the early church is a phenomenon that baffles historians. You see, this is the kicker. It, it didn't stop with this crew. It continued from them. In fact, since then, in over 2,000 years, millions of people ha have given their lives to Jesus with the belief that he rose from the dead, that, he's, that he is alive, and that the kingdom, eternal life, is centered in around Jesus. And not just millions of people believing, hundreds of thousands of people over 2,000 years and thousands of people today, now, give their lives to this message, to this gospel. And when forced by religious or government authorities to recant their faith, uh, they don't. They stand firm that Jesus rose from the dead, that he ascended to heaven with the promise to return, and that faith in him can lead to their own resurrection. That when they die, they don't stay dead. They will rise again and eternally be with Jesus. Ultimately, that Jesus is the son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And when faced with an authority that is forcing them to recant that fact or die, they choose death. That in itself is one of the greatest evidences of Christianity that baffles scholars, baffles historians, and baffles skeptics. Now, maybe you're wondering, why did the gospel spread? Why does this message of, and faith called the gospel of Jesus Christ keep spreading? Why do people keep believing? Why are you watching? Why am I preaching? Why do churches continue to plant churches? Why do they continue to send missionaries? Why do people give millions of dollars and hours of time to, to this thing called the church, to the, to the gospel, the message of Jesus, ultimately to the supernatural miracle event of the resurrection? Why do they keep doing it? Well, it comes back to our passage in Matthew 28. You see, right before Jesus ascended to heaven and promised to return, here's what, here's what Matthew records. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, this is a supernatural faith. When someone first repents of their sin, the wrong they've done, and accepts Jesus as their Savior, their Lord, that they accept that Jesus paid for their sin on the cross, but that he conquered it with that empty grave. Then they believe. They accept Jesus rose from the dead and that he's still alive. He conquered their sin and death and they want to live for him. And then Jesus uh, gives them a rebirth, as he calls it in scripture. And this means that the Holy Spirit actually comes inside of them. It's not a natural birth. It's a spiritual birth. And, and the Holy Spirit indwells within the believer of Jesus, the Christian, the follower of Christ. And, and then in that moment, they become a child of God. They're in right standing with God. And, and they receive both this earthly relationship, a connection with God that they've never had before. But then when they die, they do not die die, they will be resurrected and they will spend eternity in heaven. You see, all of that comes through Jesus. And so the question for all of us today, and the question for you is, what do you believe? What do you believe now? What has the account and evidence shown you? Uh, now that you've looked at the, the evidence of the resurrection, you've looked at the text, you've, you've heard it, you've processed it. What do you do? What do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead? That he's alive? Do you believe it or reject it? That's the question. That's the question that Jesus offered in the first century and that he has offered for over 2,000 years now. And he offers it to us now. And so maybe for you, for the first time, you're saying, no, I believe it's time. I've been on the fringe of this spiritual journey, but it's time for me to go all in. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. 
Or, or maybe for you, you've been kind of abandoning your faith for a moment. You've been on a bit of a rebellion and, and you're coming back to faith in Jesus. You maybe learned about him when you were young, but, but now it, it's all making sense again now. Or maybe for the first time. Or maybe for you, you are a follower of Jesus and you just needed this reminder just to keep you moving forward in your faith. Wherever you're at, I want to give you an opportunity now to commit to your life to Jesus for the first time or to recommit your life to Jesus. If you would like to give your life to Christ today, you can do that right now. We're going to pray, repent of our sin and choose to trust in Jesus. Pray with me. Dear Father, I'm a sinner. I do wrong things. I think wrong things. I say wrong things. But I thank you that you loved me enough to send your son Jesus to die on the cross and to pay for all that sin, all that wrong in my life. And I thank you that your son Jesus didn't stay dead, but three days later he rose from the dead, conquering my sin and wrong, conquering death, providing a way to be in good standing with you. Today I choose to believe in you and trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you and want to follow you. I believe you're alive. Father, send your Holy Spirit into my life. Give me spiritual birth. May I be reborn in you with a new heart and mind. Today I choose to follow Jesus. I put my trust in him, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, please let us know. We want to be able to pray for you, maybe with you. We can get in contact with you. Um, Please just text prayer to the number on the screen or email us. Go to the website, click the prayer link, and and let us know that you gave your life to Jesus. Or maybe you have another prayer request that, that you need. You got something going on. Let us know. Our pastor elder team will pray for you. We meet every week uh, to pray for the needs that are, that are given to us. So please let us know and we'll have people to reach out to you as well. And uh, maybe you've been looking for a faith community and you want to get more involved. Again, click that connect link on our website or text connect to the number on the screen so that you can get closer connected with our church community. Thank you. Today we celebrate that Jesus is risen, that he has conquered death. We have something to rejoice about. Psalm 34 verses 1 to 4 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. We're going to sing a new song here this morning. Maybe you just want to listen, but it just says, Oh Christ, be magnified. Let's lift up his name. He is worthy to be praised. And oh, Christ, be magnified. Let his praise arise. And Christ, be magnified. Thank you, man. With a thousand 
tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear Christ be magnified we're the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we hear Christ be magnified sing oh Christ be magnified Christ be magnified in 